All right. Good evening, friends, and welcome. I'm Bill Harmer, the Executive Director of the Westport Library. The library is proud to once again partner with Team Westport to support the annual Teen Diversity Essay Contest. We are so pleased to present the virtual awards ceremony live inside the forum of the library uh, for this year's contest so our finalists have an opportunity to share their extraordinary essays, not only with everyone in the room here today, but with uh, the folks that are joining us watching from home. While last year's Team Westport essay focused on stereotypes, this year's challenge asked students to express their individual interpretation of the statement Black Lives Matter and consider why conversations are often emotionally charged regarding race. And given this, what would they suggest as solutions for uh, equality in our communities and in our country? Freedom of expression and unfettered access to information are rights that form the bedrock of a constitutional democracy. We expect people to be self-governing, but to do so responsibly and effectively. In order to make sound choices, our citizens must be well informed. And folks, we're, we're in the best place in the community for that, uh, the public library, a place that Andrew Carnegie called the cradle of democracy. So I can think of no safer, more unbiased environment for these young essayists to inform us about sensitive issues affecting their lives and their community than the Westport Library, where all opinions are valued and heard. Providing this venue to explore and discuss these somewhat uncomfortable topics is not only my duty, but it's my honor and privilege to do so as well. And now without further ado, I'd like to invite First Selectman Jim Marpy to the stage to say a few words. Thank you, Bill. And on behalf of the town of Westport, I want to congratulate our essay winners for, being, uh, for their award-winning essays. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I cannot tell you how impressed I am with what you've written and how well you've written and described it. So uh, Jalen and Maxwell and Curtis, congratulations to you and to your families who are here with us tonight. Uh, I think it's important to, to reflect on this past year when Team Westport and its role have never been so important as they were. And uh, as we've gone through uh, uh, an amazing time in this country uh, and a challenging time for our country, for our community, uh, I am grateful that Team Westport was there in the role it plays and that we were able to, uh, as we have for years now, this is one of my favorite events I was telling some of you earlier, We've, uh, we've sponsored the uh, teen essay contest, and each year the essays just get better and better. And what you've written and what we'll hear shortly is a reflection uh, of your skills and capabilities and, and your experiences, but frankly, I think the experiences of our community and this country for the past year. Yesterday, when I had the opportunity to uh, get a preview of your essays and, and read them, uh, I also happened to have just listened to a newscast and made the observation that uh, yesterday happened to be uh, the 53rd anniversary of the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And that got me to thinking a little bit about when I first came, when, when I, I think was conscious of uh, the challenges that uh, minorities in this country really faced. And I began to think about, uh, in relation to your essays, uh, something that I read when I was a junior in high school, which uh, was Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham, Birmingham jail. And if you've not read it, uh, you should, because it's a powerful statement uh, that came uh, in the midst of the civil, what, what I relate to as the civil rights movement. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, the statement now, 
and and then the and the uh, the letter itself was reflective and is reflected in the essays that you've written. And uh, I'll just read a, a quick quote. I, I, I looked it back up again just because I remember as a teenager it having an impact on me and raising my consciousness about the challenges we face uh, face then as a society and sadly still face. So to quote Dr. King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. And I think that speaks to uh, the messages that you all have put together in your essays as well. So again, on behalf of the town of Westport, I congratulate uh, all three of you and your families. And it's my pleasure now to introduce the chairman uh, and longtime uh, leader of Team Westport, Harold Bailey, my good friend, Harold, and we'll come up right after we get the microphone clean. Good evening. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you as well, as well as our, uh, our Zoom audience that's out there today. And uh, on behalf of Team Westport, uh, which is this year celebrating its 18th year as either a task force or a committee here in town, uh, I'd like to welcome you for our signature event for the year. Um, you know, our mission for the last 18 years has been to make Westport an increasingly welcoming town with respect to race, religion, ethnicity, and LGBTQIA issues. Um, and in that sense, when we take a look at, at any of those areas, we're talking about really the, the, the dynamic of othering that goes on in the country. And if we talk about racial othering, uh, what's come to the forefront now in the last year here in this country is a real, well, uh, real reckoning with that dynamic that's gone on. It's a 400-year-old dynamic of racism, white supremacy, uh, a kind of poison that permeates everything we do here in this country. And what we are, have been excited about doing and seeing is the interest that's come here and that's, that's kind of not over overtaken that nation, but has also come into Westport itself with respect to addressing that and starting to dismantle some of the inequities that have been driven by that, that, that kind of poison for those 400 years. Um, often though, when we hear about terms like Cise Puede or stop uh, AAPI hate uh, or Black Lives Matter, they seem like they're really different issues or different swaths, but the truth is they're swaths addressing the same cloth. And that cloth is really what's going on for the last 400 years here and the template that's been set in terms of, of othering from a racial point of view. If you want to find out whether or not we're on the right track as a town, in my opinion, um, you look to the youth in town to find out what they are thinking, what they are saying, how they see the world before they head out of the bubble into the world. And, and uh, again, our eighth year of, of holding this contest is a primary way for the town to get a look at where our youth stands with respect some, to some of these key issues here. And of course, tonight, as was already mentioned, um, we're gonna focus on Black Lives Matter. But first, a little bit of process so that you understand how we get to where we got in terms of the essays that were chosen as for, and the finalists that were chosen here this evening. Um, and so I, I will now introduce our head of the essay committee, and the person who actually first came up with the idea for Westport, uh, Susan Ellis.
Good evening. I always look forward to these evenings and enjoy them very much. This is the seventh annual essay contest sponsored by Team Westport. The purpose of the contest is to engage teens in thinking about and confronting the effects of prejudice on themselves, their peers, their community, and our country, and to consider actions they and others can take to mitigate and eliminate prejudice and its effects on all of us. How do we get these topics? Well, some years there's a lot of discussion. Team Westport is a very big group now, and we have to all be in agreement. Some years it takes a lot of time and thought and working on topics, but this year, Black Lives Matter seems so important to all of us that we really came to the topic very, very quickly. We always rely a lot on the educators who are on Team Westport, both at Staples High School and at Greens Farms Academy, because we want to be sure that whatever topic we pick will actually engage teenagers, something they will care about. What, how do we do this? Well, as you know, because you have um, children who have done it this year, or you students know how to do it, uh, the essays are sent to town hall where Margaret Pinero collects them. She takes all the identifying information off and attaches a number to every essay. She's the only one who knows which person goes with which number. And she then emails them to the judges. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you who the judges are. Um, so when the judges get these essays, again, they don't know who is writing them and they can look at them not even knowing whether it's a male or a female unless that shows up in the essay itself. The judges this year, our chief judge is Dr. Judy Hamer, and she has been our chief judge ever since we started this. She's a former professor of writing, and in a minute she's going to explain to you the process that the judges use to make their decisions. Another judge is Andy Friedland, who is the assistant director of the Connecticut ADL. Ramin Ganeshram, she's a member of Team Westport, as is Dr. Judy Hamer. She's also president of the Westport History Museum and a writer, a published writer in her own right. And Alex Giannini, who's running around doing everything here today, director of programs and events here at the Westport Library. And now I'm happy to introduce to you Dr. Judy Hamer, who will tell you their process for judging. Hello, everybody. I'm Judge Judy. <laughs> uh, and I want to talk about the um, rubric that we use for judging the essays. Uh, and then just a tiny bit about the essays, because I, I'd like you to listen to them very carefully. Uh, there are six categories that we look at the essays for. One of them is ideas. What are the ideas in the essay? Uh, how novel or different are they? Another one is organization. Uh, and I've taught writing long enough to know that even senior executives have, have issues with how to organize a piece of writing. So are those ideas organized in a way that a reader can follow? The third one is voice. Does the essay sound as if there's a person behind it? Uh, the fourth one is word choice. Are the words different? Are they used in a particular and sustainable way? The fifth one is sentence fluency. Do the sentences run together? Do they make sense one after another? Or could you just take sentence number five and put it up where sentence number one is and it wouldn't make any difference? Uh, and of course, the last one is conventions, grammar, grammar and punctuation, uh, which I know you guys have been hearing about 
ever since you were in probably second grade. One of the things that we all noticed about the essays this year, uh, and the choice was not all that difficult, is that the essays seem to talk to each other. There is a very personal essay. There is an essay that takes a, almost a contra point of view, so it talks to the personal essay. And then there's another essay uh, that is overarching. And I think since we're going to hear from the third the, the uh, third place winner first, you'll hear the overarching one first, then you'll hear the one uh, that was terrifically well organized, uh, but kind of takes a step back, and then you'll hear the very personal one. So sit back, enjoy, I know I will, and I'm glad to see all of you. Well, now for the fun part. Okay. First, let me read the challenge for this year. The statement Black Lives Matter has become politicized in our country. In 1,000 words or fewer, describe your own understanding of the statement. Consider why conversations about race are often so emotionally charged. Given that reality, what suggestions do you have for building both equity and equality in our schools, our community, and our country. Okay. Well, I'm pleased to announce uh, the third place winner is uh, Jaden Mello, um, who wins for her essay, The Responsibility of a Nation. Jaden. I'll hang on to this okay. afterwards. We'll take pictures. Okay. Okay. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McLean. Names most of us recognize. But have you heard of Rayshard Brooks, a Tatiana Jefferson, Botham Jean? Somehow, so many victims of racially charged violence go unrecognized. Though we didn't treat them as such, all of these black lives mattered. Despite the simple, honorable roots of Black Lives Matter, it has been twisted into a politically charged statement due to white people's threatened reaction to the movement caused by lack of awareness. In our current political environment, the phrase Black Lives Matter has been twisted into a complex, controversial phrase. But its origins are simple and meant to acknowledge the oppression of people of color. It is a reminder to our world that black voices need to be heard and are worth listening to just as much as anyone else's. It simply means that black lives matter as much as white lives. All lives can't matter until black lives matter. So this phrase, this movement, is simply putting the focus onto a group of people that are not being treated as if they matter. Many turn against this movement, screaming all lives matter in response. But this is a knee-jerk defensive reaction. Often the people who feel so threatened by the Black Lives Matter movement are accustomed to feeling a level of comfort in this world that has been built for them. However, these people must understand that Black Lives Matter does not mean that Black Lives are superior. Despite centuries of protests, people of color are still oppressed and silenced. Our nation's system is still pitted against them. Like Malcolm X said amidst the civil rights movement in the 1960s, black people are fed up with the dilly-dallying, pussyfooting, compromising approach that we've been using toward getting our freedom. We want freedom now. People of color have been denied their rights for centuries 
and thus it is inevitable that they have become more and more impatient. They are tired of being told to wait for justice, respect, safety, and freedom. And with this frustration boiling for centuries, emotions have begun to overflow and surge through our nation. Despite calls for change, people of color are still harmed. Yet somehow, many still expect them not to fight back. Malcolm X said that he believed it was a crime for anyone who was being abused to allow themselves to continue to be victimized without defending themselves. The author Tahisi Coates said that you do not give your body to the billy clubs of the Birmingham sheriffs. We must never submit ourselves to defiling and plunder. Despite their peaceful attempts to fight for equality, black people are still violently punished for these actions, constantly forced to accept abuse. Black people should not have to put themselves in harm's way to fight for justice. But it is also a crime to stand by and watch someone else be abused without defending them. White people must recognize that they have led privileged lives and thus need to be willing to sacrifice parts of themselves in order to defend their fellow black citizens. As a white person, I will never be able to understand this pain and suffering, nor the frustration that must come with it. However, I do understand that we cannot leave people of color to defend themselves from defiling and plunder. We must take part as equals in their, in their fight act as shields to protect them in their virtuous fight. We must stand with them, for it is our responsibility to not force them to defend themselves and their rights alone. In order to be allies of the Black Lives Matter movement, white people must yearn to be educated. We must not take over the movement, but simply listen and empathize so that we can better understand the oppression people of color are first forced to endure as best we can. Only by doing this can we strive to become better, more useful teammates of those who have been oppressed. Like Malcolm X said, on the American racial level, we had to approach the black man's struggle against the white man's racism as a human problem. None of us are innocent. None of us should be comfortable watching these events unfold without doing anything about it. Thus, like Malcolm X believed, we are all responsible to spread awareness and education. The greater understanding people have of our nation's history of oppressing people of color, of what has created this sense of entrapment and desperation, the more they will be able to sympathize with the movement and hopefully eventually support it and become a part of it. Only by each person working to educate themselves and those around them will Black Lives Matter be able to become depoliticized which will in turn enable people to become more open-minded. Only by doing this will the movement be able to achieve its greatest and most influential potential in our communities and our nation. Thank you. Our next winner is Curtis Sullivan. For his essay, Black Lives Can Matter More, here's how. Curtis? Thank you. In 
In the 1950s and 1960s, African Americans protested unjust laws, which eventually helped frame the Civil Rights Act. But racial discrimination remains embedded in society even half a century later. On May 25th, 2020, at the height of the worst pandemic the world had seen in over 100 years, tragedy struck the streets of Minneapolis. George Floyd, an African American man, was apprehended by police forces after unknowingly using a counterfeit $20 bill in a convenience store. He found himself with a knee on his neck, pinned by a police officer when he gasped, I can't breathe, a phrase that became a symbol for the movement that ensued. After nine long minutes, he died. The coming weeks saw mass protests around the country, demanding an end to police violence and racial discrimination, calling for racial equality through laws and police reform, and raising awareness of implicit discrimination. The movement, dubbed Black Lives Matter, or BLM, was anything but novel. But the added strain of the COVID-19 pandemic, plus additional instances of the lack of police restraint when dealing with blacks only fueled the flames of racial unrest. There is no doubt that Black Lives Matter will be one of the most important movements of our time. While powerful and necessary, the BLM movement has, one, has some critical weaknesses that have been startling, startlingly overlooked. These include failure to communicate the movement's message and purpose, and lack of proper leadership to maintain relevance. Left unaddressed, these weaknesses undermine the movement's call to reform. A clear and easy to understand message is critical to any effective communications, but particularly to a social movement. Suffragists argued for the right to vote. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about a dream that all Americans were equal. Black Lives Matter is a catchy phrase that left too much room for interpretation and confusion by too many. Some people who are opposed to the BLM movement felt that Black Lives Matter silences anyone who isn't black. They believe that the movement is saying that only black lives matter and suggest that non-black lives don't matter. As such, oppositionists have responded to the BLM movement with their own, dubbed all lives matter. They tried to convey the message that every life matters, including non-black lives. All Lives Matter misses the point that blacks have seen systemic oppression since the founding of this country. In their efforts to remind BLM dissenters about the importance of black lives, the protesters stoked fears in some non-blacks, albeit unfounded, that black lives might matter more than non-black lives. A simple fix might be changing the slogan to Black Lives Matter Too" or Black Lives Also Matter. This change clarifies the message behind the Black Lives Matter movement while disallowing oppositionists from claiming that their life might not also matter. Undermining the call to reform, the Black Lives Matter movement failed to be clear about their purpose. During the initial phase of the movement, Protests helped spawn rioting and violence. However, most of the rioters were not actual BLM protesters. Instead, opportunists were hiding behind the name and momentum to initiate their own, rampage, uh, own rampages and post political agendas. Oppositionists were quick to accuse the BLM movement as supporting anarchy, distracting from the movement's intentions to provide and improve racial equality. These fears of anarchy were echoed by then President Trump, who used the violence as an escape hatch to get out of addressing racism as the crisis and root of the movement. Several, several times, Trump denied the existence of systemic racism in the United States. Rather, he pushed a message of law and order and suggesting that the BLM movement was only demonstrating lawlessness and ignoring the peaceful side of the movement. Why were policymakers so focused on the violent side of the movement instead of the original call to action? 
because when riots first broke out, people within the BLM movement who were calling for social justice reform failed to denounce the riots. The movement's message was not clear that it was advocating for police reform. Certain members of the movement even supported the riots and their violence. This distracted the public and drew policymakers' attention away from reform and towards suppressing riots. Most importantly, the BLM movement lacks key figures that the public can identify as its rightful leaders. During the civil rights movement, leaders were the public face. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and Malcolm X were able to vocalize the vision and keep people engaged in the fight for the end of racial segregation. This also culminated in the famous March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended racial segregation in the United States. Every effective movement has some form of, have some, has some form of leadership representation to help communicate the message of the movement. A person for the public to listen to and for policymakers to meet with for negotiation and courses of action. Leaders can denounce violence in the name of the movement and keep, public, and keep a public audience focused on the initial call. Many will say that the BLM movement shouldn't have leadership as it is more focused on black voices coming together against injustice. But leadership is important to maintain relevance and organization in the movement. One modern example is the global climate strike of September 2019, spearheaded by Greta Thunberg. This movement caused people around the world to protest, encouraging world leaders to take action against climate change. Similar to concrete leadership that can help the BLM movement and effectively convey an impactful message. The BLM movement will be remembered for centuries to come. The call for social injustice reform has left a lasting impact on society. However, without a clearer message and strong leadership, the BLM movement will face significant obstacles in affecting major reform. With these changes, I am hopeful that it will be able to fight for a safe and harmonious future for all and for generations to come. Thank you very much. It just hit me that, uh, you know, the winners all get a really nice plaque, but there's kind of another element to this, which is that there is some money attached. <laughs> and I, um, I guess I, I've been remiss in stating that the third place winner gets $500, the second place winner gets $750, and the first place winner gets $1,000. And so, let me announce that our first place winner is Maxwell Tanksley for his essay, The Words of Power. Uh, he wins first place and $1,000. Maxwell, come on up. Now or am I reading? Do it right after, after you read. All right. You got to put in that memo. <laughs>
does your life matter? For many in Westport, this question borders on absurd. How could my life not matter? For us people of color, however, this question has become more pressing and the answer more disturbing. For me, the answer to that simple question comes from the deepest depths of history and identity, and it emerges not as a fully formed manifesto or speech, but as a bundle of strong emotions. My life matters. I decided on that one pretty quickly. I've also decided that would be the end of it if I were white. There is not a doubt in my mind that my life matters to me. I recognize my own worth. I recognize my own ability. I believe, for those same reasons, that my life matters to God and to the universe. But does my life matter to society? To put it bluntly, does my life matter as much to the society we live in as that of a white man? No. My life, black lives, simply matter less to the society we live in than those of our white counterparts, and we see it every day. We see it in Trayvon Martin, shot dead in the street. We see it in George Floyd, whose pleas and cries were met with stone-cold silence. We see it in incarceration rates with black Americans only 12% of the population, making up 33% of the prison population. We see it in the courts where our killers go free. We see it in jobs that won't hire us and in laws that target us. We even see it in our friends who say, he wouldn't have been shot if he weren't resisting, or of course you got into that school, you're black. This vast dichotomy between what our lives ought to be worth and what they are worth is why the statement Black Lives Matter means so much to me. It fills that gap and expresses, contrary to society, that my life does matter. When I say those words, Black Lives Matter, I feel so many things. I feel pride in my black heritage. I feel awe at the tenacity of my ancestors who suffered for being black. I feel enraged that I will be judged not by the content of my character, but by the color of my skin. All these latent feelings, all characteristic of the black experience in America, explode cathartically when I say that phrase, black lives matter. Of course, as my interpretations of black lives matter are colored by my experiences, so too are those of others. I remember playing video games with a group of friends when the topic of recent Black Lives Matter protests came up. One of them began to casually rant about how Black Lives Matter are criminals. I remarked I had an inherent interest in Black Lives Matter, and he flew into a tirade. He raved on and on about the sins of Black Lives Matter for nearly 10 minutes until another friend pulled him into a call to deliver a nugget of information. See, he hadn't known I was black. We'd never met in person, so he assumed that I, like everyone else in the group, was white. As soon as he learned my race, his demeanor changed. Somehow, the mere presence of someone with dark skin had caused his arguments to market morph into backpedaling at such speed that I began to fear for his health. His and my reaction both were indicative of two different understandings of the phrase Black Lives Matter, produced from two different worldviews from two different worlds. He understood it to be the rallying cry of self-victimizing criminals, using the wrongs of a distant past to create unjustified chaos. He saw groups of rioters marching down the main street with police cars burning in the background. My rallying cry of empowerment was his siren song of destruction. Now, our discussions around race are often emotional 
because we have so many emotional memories relating to race, memories that we will use to form our opinions on the matter. A child who was mercilessly bullied for coming from the poor side of town and one who felt they unfairly lost their spot on a sports team to a child of a different complexion will have different views on race going forward. And both of them will react emotionally when it's discussed. Because my past experiences with race were emotional, my view of race is an emotional one. I react emotionally when the topic is brought up. I am emotional for my support of Black Lives Matter, and I am emotional in my denunciations of systemic racism. On the other hand, my friend was equally emotional in his denunciations of Black Lives Matter. The emotions involved with discussions of race can be a problem, but they are also the solution. These emotions can cause feelings to be hurt and friendships to be broken, but they can also be the key to finding common ground. When my friend learned I was black, he immediately began to consider how much his words affected me. He and I had both felt the same emotions at different points in our lives. And he, if only subconsciously, began to empathize with me. He began to understand why I felt the way I did. Now, needless to say, not all issues of race will be solved with a magical cure of understanding. As much as we'd like it to be, reality isn't a children's cartoon. However, honest, open-minded discussions of race are the best step we can take towards promoting both equity and equality in our society. By having these emotional conversations about race and by using these emotions to promote empathy instead of fuel conflict, we can create a bridge to connect people with disparate experiences. By having these conversations, we will encourage effective interracial communication and we will use empathy to create a better experience for all people. Well, in closing, I really want to thank um, the essayists for the depth of their thought and, and really the insights uh, to, have, to have those kind of insights at such an early age is, is, is truly remarkable. Um, and I can tell you that these three essays are a beautiful addition to the 22 essays, including some that uh, a couple that were honorable mentioned in the past that we've had over the prior seven years. Um, again, thank you very much for the work that you did and for what you've achieved with those essays. And uh, I want to thank the parents, because the apple never falls far from the tree, and uh, <laughs> for, for, for your support as well here this evening. So once, once again, thank you, and have a great evening.